In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. Welcome back to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey, and with me again, Robert Schlieren. Thank Good you, back. Robert. Yes. All right, so we're going to get into some controversial topics today. Oh, a hot show. A hot show. <laughs> okay. uh, so you may want to go ahead and share this video with everybody that you know, um, uh, because this we're going to we're going to go into what was a uh, blockbuster film this year. Uh, good film. Jesus Revolution. What a wonderful. I cried. I did too. Well, I enjoyed it. It took me back. <laughs> the, the songs and, yeah. you know, um, you know, my kids, my adult children were asking me, you know, questions about that era. And uh, it brought back a lot of memories. Uh, so, but let's talk specifically about Lonnie Frisbee because you're, you're writing a new book, God's Generals, that's going to have gonna his life in there. Yeah. In there. Yeah. So let, let's break down the life of Lonnie Frisbee and his impact on the Jesus Revolution, the Jesus Movement. Yeah. First off, I have to recognize it was God's answer to the 60s sex revolution and all that was going on in our nation at that time. God's answer was not a Billy Graham. It was a hippie looking preacher that looked just like the hippies who God saved and began to use. And Lonnie Frisbee was that man. So let's talk, talk about his history. Let's, let's take it from the beginning. Well, I, I think we have to realize that he, he was saved in a very unusual way. Uh, as the story is told, he was on an LSD trip with no clothes on, dancing on one of the hills in California. And I know it sounds crazy, but welcome to the 60s. And so Jesus comes walking across the sky to him. Now, my brain says, you're tripping already, so how do we know it's yeah, real? Right. Now, as a historian, when you, when you hear these wild stories, how do you know if they're true? You see what kind of fruit comes after that over the years of their life that gives proof that that experience they say is true. That's how I, I do it. So he says that Jesus comes walking across the sky to him while he's in this LSD trip thing. And Jesus paraphrases what he says, I want to use you, I need you kind of thing. And so he accepts Christ and the call of God. And when that happens, he's back in his sober mind and he puts his clothes on, praise the Lord. And, yeah. and he sits down and waits for his other friends who are still doing their trips to come off their, their little dancing LSD trips. And when they get next to him, he tells them the story. Hey, I'll, I'll tell you, this, this Jesus man came walking across to me and asked me to help him. And I said, yes. And his friends go, well, can we help him too? So they all kind of join in with the like, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do this. And they didn't know what to do next, so they knew that Christians and water had something, somehow water and Christians went together. So they said, let's drive down to the ocean. Because in California, you can snow ski in the morning and surf at night. So they drove down to the ocean, they get in the water, and they know they have to go under the water, like they, they didn't use the word baptism, that's why they were explaining. And they said, well, since the Jesus dude appeared to you, you push us under. So he started pushing the, the people under, and the other hippies on the beach, because, hey, man, what are you doing? And he starts telling the story. And that, to me, is where the revival began, right there on the beaches of California. So he wasn't, <laughs> it's definitely not one of those cerebral, not at all. you know, seeking the truth and yeah. discovering who Jesus yeah. really was and knowing that it was real. I mean, this was a bizarre, here's the part I love about this story. Uh, first off, it's true, but God met him where Lonnie was. was at. On a hill. <laughs> on a hill. <laughs> That's the trip. Close or no close. But I mean, he met him where he was at, yeah. reached him in a way that he could reach them. And then, uh, and then this, you know, obviously it birthed um, the movement. So take up the story from there. Let's well, then up. he kind of starts his journey. He, he looks like Jesus anyway with the long hair and the beard. Right. So he kind of dresses a little bit like him. That's what he's doing. And he gets excited about the Lord. Long story short, he ends up in, in Costa Mesa, California, Orange County. And uh, Chuck Smith's daughter bumps into this guy and brings him home. Right. And that is a, the beginning of a very important relationship for the revival. Chuck Smith was, um, he was a four square guy at one time, four square pastor. He had uh, been around the full gospel world to the point where he had become nervous about Pentecostal charismatic manifestations of the spirit and the extreme extremities 
and the uh, false ones, to where he was paranoid about all of it through his whole life, to be honest with you. He, he pushed it aside. Or he, didn't, he didn't embrace it like Lonnie did. Lonnie flowed in all the gifts, in the miracles and the healings. Chuck supported because he saw that it was working, but yet when problems came, he didn't know what to do about it. And so the two met, I'm going to get ahead of myself, the two met, and uh, long, they became friends. And Chuck Smith, to give him credit, he was able to see that this guy God is really with, even though it's bizarre. He acts bizarre and do all these things that are not outside of his little box, but he welcomes them. What happens is they start having meetings and the kids have no place to have meetings. So Chuck Smith has a church. He said, well, you can use it on all, on all the church nights. And so they begin to pack the church out. And eventually he had to make a decision to embrace this Lonnie Frisbee and the Jesus People Revival Movement um, or reject it. And so he embraced it and lost members of the church, but it was the best thing in his life because the revival took off and it began in a tent and they began to water baptize in, in, on the beaches in California. And it spread across the country as a counterculture thing to the, the, uh, the sex 60s revolution. Is that, all that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. So let, let me kind of recap here. Okay. Understand, because I had to explain this to my adult children. Up to that point, the, a guitar wasn't in church. Oh, yeah, yeah. A drum set was for sure wasn't in church, and something electric, you yeah. know, you didn't I do that. I remember those days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, those things were not in church. So this was a, for the, the Jesus movement, for someone to come into church with long hair and not wear a suit and have shoes or no shoes and be clean or not clean, that was really radical. Yeah. And, then to, and then you put on top of that this new music. Uh, they broke the contemporary was, Christian music era. They really did. And that, but that was so unnerving. And we, it's really easy to look back now and go, oh, those people just missed it. And no. It was a big no, deal. It was a big, it was a big shift yeah. in the Christianity in America because of suddenly we can, you know, it's okay to play the guitar and have music. Yeah. I mean, Sing much less. Choruses and hymns. Yeah, exactly. And so that was, that was the atmosphere that changed. Yet he, he was seeing some miracles. Signs, wonders, talk about that. Well, Lonnie Frisbee had um, all the gifts flowing through his ministry. He had miracles, uh, healings, deliverances, all kinds of things. And, and it's documented. People in California, I knew they were healing the services. And so it was happening and it was rolling. So it spread like that. Plus, they were very bold in their faith and sharing their faith. There's one thing about the Jesus people. They were really out there with sharing their faith with anybody and everybody. And that was one of the great marks of that revival. They Nobody... Were they scared to walk up to and tell you about, their, about, about Jesus? They were just that bold. And right. they're so bizarre looking, you didn't know what to do with them at first, like run or listen, yeah. you know. Right. So you, it's not, it wasn't just church people. It was society, too. That whole sex revolution changed our view of marriage and sex and clothes and all that stuff. And the rock and roll industry went to new kind of music. So that whole thing was happening. And God found Lonnie Frisbee and Chuck Smith and the people to lead that revival. And it became a worldwide movement. I was in Denmark a few months ago, and I asked about, because I knew he'd gone there. Lonnie Frisbee came there for about 10 days, and 15 churches were born that are still going today. Wow. And I'm like, 15? I'm like, yeah. He came, and people got saved and went home and started churches around the country. He was more of an apostolic kind of guy in the terms we use today. And I don't think they understood that back, because every place he went, he did it. Now, he is responsible for two major church networks, the Calvary Chapel churches out of Costa Mesa under Chuck Smith, and the Vineyard with John Wimber. Both of those are Lonnie Frisbee connections. They come That's up right. and bless them. So this guy was not just uh, a novice or a side issue. He was a major character in church history and in charismatic history. And so, but they, what happened was, like in every revival, there's things that go on that people have to deal with. It's sure. called humans in the revival. It just yep. happens. So Lonnie Frisbee had gotten married and uh, had a good family, but they were having family issues. And they didn't know where to go to work on their issues. And so he left the Chuck Smith And this is way before Christian counseling yeah. was a thing. Yeah, it's, it's way before. So he left and went to Fort Lauderdale to be a part of what they call the New Wine, or eventually it was nicknamed the Shepherding Movement. He went down there hoping to get help, but it was worse down there. 
So he returns back to California and goes back to Chuck Smith and Chuck brings him in and that's a new parking lot ministry. So, which is fine, but you had a guy that birthed you. Now he has to be disciplined. This would be, and that's what they do. So that was a little hard on some people. Yeah, he was parking the cars, yeah. directing cars where to park. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure that was a staggering. But he uh, did it. He did it. That's yeah, the he, point. He, he did it. I don't think that would have been the appropriate way to deal with him. Right. But uh, that was what they did back then. And but I look at it, I thought he did do it. So he was not a rebellious person trying to find a position. He needed help. The problem with the Longing for Israel story is the people that had influence did not know how to help him with his problems. They didn't have Christian counseling for the marriage that we do today or the other sexual challenges he would have in his life. And so they didn't know what to do. So what Chuck said, well, things are happening. God is moving. We're not going to deal with that. We're going to do this. That's what they did back then. So I don't criticize Chuck. That's not the best answer. That's what they did. And so they did their best. So the marriage broke up. And Lonnie Frizzy backslid for a while. And during that time of being backslidden in his life, he got back into the old 60s lifestyle. Now, I want, I want to talk about this because it happens up to a lot of people. Before you get saved, what you do to medicate yourself to get through pain or to get through tough times, if you're not careful, you'll go back and do it again because that's what you know. Sure. So when he lost his family, the church he was a part of did not embrace him or know what to do with him. He reverted back to how do I solve my pain? How do I do I? And he got back into the 60s drug sex activity in that, in that, in that time. So I want to let people know that you cannot, I find it very hard to beat pe people up when people you're looking to don't help you. Right. And you, you've got to do something and it may not be right. That's why some preachers go back into alcoholism. They go back. Sure. In, that's what they were doing before they were saved. And now in the Christian world, they're not getting the help or they not, whatever, and they go back to that. So I don't like it, but that's what it is. So during that time, he got, he got HIV, he got AIDS. And uh, so this is why people don't like his story, but I think it's a great story, that, and it should be told accurately, that he was not a gay man, according to his own words, but he was a 60s hippie guy. Now that means you drink and you sleep with everybody. Yeah. And that, that's what they did, all right? So that's what Lonnie Frisbee and a lot of that generation came out of. That's why those young believers become elders in churches there, and we keep having certain problems at a higher percentage. Well, that's a good point. Because good that's point. what they did. Yeah. That's when the sexual revolution in this country took place. We broke down the family, we broke down the morality, and we had these big orgies and drugs and slept with whoever, whatever. That's what he did. So I'm not trying to excuse it, but I'm trying to explain it to where we're not killing him again because he's sure. been unjustly dealt with because of that issue. Because he died of AIDS does not mean that he was gay. It does not mean that we throw everything he did out the door. So I, I, I hate that I have to talk like this about him so bluntly because it is. But I think we have to, we have to come up, we have to tell people the, the whole story. Yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, we don't want to not tell you what, happen you, you need to be able to understand what really happened so so he's a parking lot Let, let's don't leave him in, in the parking lot okay <laughs> so he was a parking lot working with his parking lot and he, he finally smith. gets back into some ministry and then a young man leaves chuck smith named john wimber he was a part of the thing and i talked to john wimber so he told me this story so i'll tell the story uh, thank god i like to talk to people hear all these stories where they go he, he, he talked about the meeting between him and Chuck, Chuck Smith, both good men of God working together. They separated without a lot of pain and argument. They talked and separated. And John Wimber told me, he goes, as I was leaving that meeting, he goes, it was, it was painful, but yet it was not vicious. It was just, we were parting ways and we loved each other. He said, before I walked out the door, I said, Chuck, what are you going to do with all the power? He goes, I don't want it. You can have it. And John Moore said, I took it, and that's what birthed the Vineyard Movement, the power gift. So Lonnie Frisbee, Wimber takes the, this little group of Vineyard churches, starts working, has him over for a service, and the revival hits like it did in the early days of the Jesus people. Lonnie would say, Holy Spirit, come with like his line. That was his thing. When he made that comment and pull, he would hit the room. Well, that Sunday, it hit the room 
to the point that even though the elders were nervous, John Wimber was nervous, they couldn't deny that God was up to something, that, that, that they didn't know what to do. And, they, and John said, I knew, as we'll be on a discussion next week with my board and my elders and stuff, because we were nervous about this, but yet we knew something had happened. And so that's where the power side of the, of the vineyard movement got activated, mm-hmm. was that visit from Ron right. Frisbee. And so he was a great preacher. He, he was a signs and wonders man. He knew how to flow in the spirit. He had all those what I call Pentecostal traits of a great leader. And it worked. The problem was the humanity side, there never was a person or person who could help him get through the struggles of his marriage and the other aspects of his life. He tried to find somebody to help him. They did not help him. So my moral of the story is, can we help the people that come to us? If we can't help them, can we find somebody that can and get them to them? Because sometimes we just throw them out or we just push them aside. Well, it's uncomfortable and we don't know what to do, so we don't do anything. Well, see, in, that, in that time period, the, the, the gay issue, uh, the sex issue, the drug issue, we're all super sensitive. Today, we all deal with it in a different compassion than they did in the 60s and 70s. So imagine having these issues and contracting that disease. At that time, it was still viewed as God's judgment upon the gay community. And so navigating all that, where do you send a, a Holy Spirit revival guy who has a marriage problem and now has this issue, what do you do? They separate for safety and leave him alone and uh, he, he dies almost alone. The last few visits were from some of his friends, but not, not embraced like he should, in my opinion. So it's a great story with a little sad end. I think the movie is a great movie. I think it's one of the best Christian movies I've seen in a long time. The storyline of the Jesus Revolution is pretty accurate to the story of, of the whole revival with a few little things, but that, it's not... A, it's little things. You know? yeah. We well, historians see the little things that gripe about them. But overall, it's a great, great story. And people should see And it gives Lonnie Frisbee a, a, a proper viewing. It makes Chuck Smith become the dominant personality there, which that's where I quirk a little bit like, I love you, Chuck. But if it wasn't for Lonnie, there'd be no Chuck. So <laughs> Chuck did not create Lonnie. Lonnie created right. Chuck. But Chuck was smart enough to embrace the revival and organize and give it room. And I have to give him credit. He worked through a lot of those traditional issues. Yes, he did. You got to give that guy a huge. Oh, he did. You know, <clears throat> hippies. There's no politics like church politics. <laughs> yeah. And these are hippies. Yeah. Like you said, come to church barefoot, making new music and all this yeah. stuff. And some are still living loose, but they love right. Jesus, all that. He had to embrace all of that as a traditional evangelical four square pastor. And he did well. And he built a movement out of it today. And um, the, 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 the weakness of that is that uh, Mr. Chuck Smith did, had seen so many people misuse the gifts and abuse the gifts that he pulled back from it. And through the whole Calvary Chapel network, there's a gulf. They believe in it, they know it exists, but it's over there. And that's the way they do it because of their founder. Now you come over to John Wimber, it's a whole different ballgame because John embraced it. And so it, power evangelism, all that came out of there. Those are Lonnie Frisbee's kids. Yeah. Lonnie Frisbee's kids. How was the story? That's good. That's a good story. I, and, and I want, and I'm, you needed to know the truth. There's the truth of what happened. It's not the first time there was a problem. It won't be the last time there's a problem with a great leader. It just happens to be that this leader was one of the first ones that had that particular challenge that went public. And the generation at that time did not know what to do. And what they do is they isolate and damn, curse them. Yeah. And the, that's not Jesus. Jesus would have been out there helping in some way. And but what, what a great story of the grace of God on Lonnie, that he, yeah. he continued he kept to coming use back. and he kept coming, he kept yeah. bouncing back. Yeah. What, a, what a, a great, a and, great and story. Through, like in Europe, when he went to Europe, I mean, the, the, the whole coffee shop type of ministry concept comes out of that, of that revival. Right. He's on the cover of Time Magazine. He's on the news, Six O'Clock News in those days, which was a big deal. Yeah, it was. And, and it was a it was a force to be to be dealt with. Now, I guess I should tell you this. Him and Captain Kuhlman did a show together, which That's is the right. two extremes. That's right. You got Miss Kuhlman with her white dress and all that uh, on TV. We're not a white dress, but you know how she is. And he is invited by her to come on with Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. And I, there's a film of it. And he's you know, dressed as a hippie next to elegant Captain Kuhlman. 
Now that right there says only God can put these two kinds of people That's together. Right. I mean, that is the work of the Lord to have the hippie and Miss Kuhlman, the two dominant figures at that time, on her show, and she's just loving it, and he's loving it, and all the kids are around her singing songs. When you're in the spirit, you can overcome the barefoot, you can overcome the clothes, because the commonality is the spirit that we all love and Jesus who we obey. And you can see that with Catherine and, and Ronnie in that film. So this great massive move is birth Jesus movement. Yeah. Lonnie's in the center of it. And it's interesting to me, and you mentioned this in the very beginning of the story, that it went straight to water baptism. They didn't even really understand all of what yeah. they were doing, but they knew this yeah. is something we're supposed to go do. Yeah. Now let's fast forward to 2023, and what did we see? And really in 22 and up in Dawsonville with Pastor Todd, baptism again is a big yeah. move of God. Things are happening with water baptism. Isn't that interesting that we see that happening again, that manifestation? It's a part of being a Christian. It's a part of following Christ's example, and we're told to do this. And I think it becomes a part of our desire as Christians to do it. And it's two things that are growing across America. Communion is a bigger deal, and water baptism is at an all-time high. No longer are we doing once a month communion. We're doing it every week, every time we meet. Right. It's a whole different, and water baptism is happening in all kinds of places. I'm a part of the Dawsonville uh, movement there. I actually live there part-time. And they come in from everywhere to get baptized. They're getting healed and getting delivered. And that revival is being led so well by Pastor Todd and Karen Smith. It's beautiful. But I sat there when I first went there, I thought, what is this? I mean, I knew baptism was always a part of revival right. movements, but in that one, it's a focal point. That's where all the wild stuff happens when you get in the water in Dawsonville. That's where the stuff happens. It's God's emphasizing it for some reason, and I like it. Yeah, what do you, he says three seconds in the water. It and brother, everything. it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. <laughs> Let me just say something. Some people get upset by the way God does things. When you go to Dawsonville, don't fight the baptism. Go get baptized. Like when you're with Or Roberts, don't fight the left hand or right hand. Get with the right hand because the right hand has the mirror. Cooperate with how God is working. See, we have, a, well, let's, I got I baptized in 1971 at a Gerald Durstein camp in Strawberry Lake, Minnesota. Yeah, hey, I've been there. And it was cold <laughs> in the middle of the summertime. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of people have point back to that baptism, you know, going, going to someplace like Dawsonville and seeing what God's doing. You know, your first impression is, well, I got baptized. I don't need that. Yeah. Is it okay to get baptized more than once? I asked Pastor Todd this. I want to hear what you had to say. I think it's okay. I don't think you're redoing the first baptism, but it may be a, a recommitment or, you know, it might be for a miracle. I mean, there are... Naaman was called to baptize, dip right. in the water, if you want to look at it like that. So that's when I just start going through all those scriptures in my head. And plus the Jewish faith embraces baptism a lot bigger than the Christian faith because there's yes. more baptisms in their faith. So some of that I think we were discovering and we were only were stuck into one. So being in Dawsonville, I just sat there and think, okay, there's nothing illegal about this scripturally. It's my tradition talking. There is no scripture against you get baptized a second time. We're not redoing the first, but you want to make a rededication or you want to ask God to wash something out of your life. I'm okay with that. There's no sure. scripture against that. And that's what's happening. So to me, if you need 15 baptisms, get right, go get them. I'm fine. But the first one, we're not, we're not replacing the first one. Right. The first that's one is of itself. But man. there may be other reasons that that type of thing would be for you. So when you look back on the Lonnie Frisbee era and the Jesus movement, what should we take? Now, I, little statistics, 40% of those that got saved, this is, I think Barna did this a long time ago, 40% of those saved during the Jesus movement remained. The rest left for whatever reason. You know, I think a lot of that was because they weren't accepted. Yeah. You know, churches didn't accept it. I remember when it came to our little church in Atlanta, Georgia, and I, you know, the pastor didn't know how to handle it there. So they, they didn't stay, yeah, yeah. they went somewhere else. Yeah. Where, where do you think, how, what does that say? What should we take from the Jesus movement that maybe we've left? I think we're gonna to have to be able to open ourselves to different kinds of people and behavior that is not our custom or might infringe on our preferences for the sake of Christ being developed in a person's life or discipled. And we have to get rid of that tradition or that, that, that preference. We all have it. There's certain ways I like to do church, sure. certain ways I like people. But if they're not like that, can we fit? Can we do the gospel? Can we, can, we, can we do that? And I think in the times that we're living, 
when gross darkness is hitting the earth like we've ever seen, when those people start coming to our churches, they're not going to come cleaned up. They're going to come to get cleaned up. And they're going to come in with all that stuff. And it's only wilder than Jesus' people when it starts coming to our churches today. We got people who think they're cats. We got people with, we have all kinds of people. When they start well, coming through the door, folks, we're going to have to have faith and I, compassion. I agree, and I truly believe, this is just my, my belief, our Jesus movement that we have to deal with now, people come in with, you know, like come walking with shorts and flip-flops, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, however, you know, what are we going to do with the transgenders when they come into your church? How are you going to handle that? Yeah. Are you going to stand up and let be open arm? Are you going to let grace rule? Are you, but are you going to keep preaching the, the truth and not waver on that? Yeah. This is our generation's big challenge, I believe, is, as we it's come through start. all of this. <laughs> yeah. As we come through all of this, and even as the gender issue has gone on, people are we're already seeing the detransition people coming back, back out and saying, this is not what I thought it would be. The church has an awesome opportunity to stand in the gap there and say, let us love you. Let us pull you back in and understand. So uh, a lot of prodigals, a lot of prodigals got saved in the Jesus movement. And we've got a lot of prodigals now that need to be able to step into that place. So I'm going to ask you to pray for that, uh, Robert, before we go off the air today. Let's pray for the people that have those kids at home that they that Good the issue. they seem like they're gone yeah. they're lost forever but they're not you know what I, before you pray i always tell people sometimes you're not the one to help bring your child to, to christ but you can pray for god to send the one that they'll hear across right. their path amen and that way you're still working That's exactly because right. sometimes all you do is because your family yeah but god can bring the person who your child will listen to so I pray today for every one of you that have families with these kind of crises, that God would bring peace between you and your children. And Father, we ask right now that you would send the right person, the right people across each child's path that they will listen to, they'll believe, they'll be able to, to talk to. Send the right people across their path that the seed can be sown, can be watered, can be harvested. And Father, let the parents and the other siblings have a peace that you are working this situation out. And we refuse to be moved by what we see and hear, but we're going to believe that you're answering our prayer today, sending people across their path that will help them come to the place they need to be. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to tell you that there's a phone number on your screen that you can call. You need somebody to continue to pray with you specifically. Uh, there's a licensed prayer minister on the other end of that phone. 877 877- 281-6297. Someone's there ready to pray with you and give you the material you need. Take advantage of that. It's absolutely free. We're here to be used, as Brother Copeland would say. We're here to be used. So enjoy that opportunity. And let's come alongside each other and see those prodigals come on. Thank you, Robert. Thank you Thanks for being. taking care of this uh, sensitive topic today. Yeah, it's a great revival story. It is. Yeah, it's a great one. We'll see you next time.